So I want to actually go back a little bit and share something from a long time ago. You know how it is when somebody says something to you that's tremendously freeing and it just lives in the back of your head for a long time? 25, 30 years ago, I was back at my home church, the church I'd grown up at. And I remember the senior pastor saying something. And he said, look, when we talk about money and stewardship and giving, we want to talk about it out of our relationship with God. Not out of need, not out of we need to pay the rent, not out of we need to make this amount of money, but out of how it reflects our relationship with Jesus. And I thought that was so freeing. Because there's always that guilt of you need to pay the rent, you need to put money down, you need to do this. And that permeates a lot of churches. And I tell you that because I don't actually want to talk about money today. I want to talk about sharing our faith. Because what happens a lot of times is when somebody stands up in front to talk about sharing our faith or inviting people, it's really this subtext of, you need to bring people in, otherwise this congregation's gonna die. It happens a lot. And I can tell you this, I have interviewed with congregations and call committees where they've pretty much said that, we need you to come here so you can bring in new people and we don't die. And usually when I pick up that vibe or I hear them say that out loud, I say, Thank you. You people are very nice, but I'm not the guy you're looking for. Because when you work out of that mindset, it puts us in this weird place. And everything becomes very needy and weird, and it's out of this desperation. And it's just like, this ain't right. And I tell you all that. Because what we're doing today is we're continuing with this series talking about this question of, okay, who is God and what does it mean for us? Who are we called to be? And so what I want to do today is examine this idea that if lost people matter to God, then they should matter to us. And I would submit to you the whole story of the Bible is all about God reaching out to lost people. The very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 11 and 12, God calls this guy by the name of Abraham out of this city called Ur, which is today northern Iraq. And God says to Abraham, I am going to take you and I'm going to bless you and you are going to have more descendants than there are stars in the sky. And you are going to be a blessing to all the nations. And it's really interesting in that peace. It's not just for him, not just for his descendants, but everybody. And it is this long piece of how God is called, is reaching out and sharing who he is with everybody. You see that constantly in the Old Testament where God says to the nation of Israel, you are to be a light among the Gentiles. It's like, I've chosen you. I have this for you, but it's not just for you. Then, of course, we get to the New Testament, and there's the verse we always see at football games, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the whole story of Jesus is how Jesus came to save the lost. And if you want to put up that verse for me, I love this line out of Romans. This is one of my favorite verses. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want to focus in on that end of that first phrase, while we were still sinners. Sometimes you'll hear that translated as, while we were still enemies of God. And I love the reminder that is built into this. Because what this is saying is this is saying that none of us are perfect. None of us earn our way into heaven. And this is one of those things that it is hard for us to remember. Because we want to make it about us. We want to say that we're good enough. We've done all these good things. But the reality is, is we know we're not. But when we delude ourselves, it twists everything. 
I was talking to somebody about somebody we both know. And there's a certain personality type that we happen to recognize in this person. But you know this person. You know somebody like this. And it's somebody who does all the right things. They go to all the Bible studies. They sing in church. They do all the stuff. And they always post about it on social media about how the great things they're doing. But at the same time, the way they always come across is that they've earned God's salvation and that they're perfect and everybody else is wrong. And it's when we forget that, when we forget that peace, it turns us into something that we shouldn't be. But when we remember that Jesus died for us while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies, it gives us the peace and the ability to accept God's grace. It lets us recognize, yeah, I've fallen short and I need Jesus, but Jesus did this for me. And so let us always remember that Jesus died for us while we were still lost so that we have the freedom to share that with others. So let's talk about this. How do we share our faith? And let me loop back to the beginning. We want to do this out of love and out of generosity. Because I want you to think about it this way. How many times have you been on a call or dealing with a customer service rep or a salesperson or whatever, and they're giving you the spiel, and it sounds like they are giving you the script, and the only reason they're giving the script is because they're going to get fired if they don't? We've had that experience, and it's just kind of sad. You just kind of want to put that person out of their misery, don't you? Say, just don't, don't worry about it. Let's move on to the next thing. We don't want to be that. How many of you guys have a friend who is a grandparent who will not shut up about their grandkids, okay? It's like you mentioned something about, I don't know how the Packers are going to do without Jordan Love today, and they're like, oh, yeah, let me show you my grandkids' pictures, okay? And they're all so smart and so sweet, and they're all going to go to Harvard, okay? None of you in this room would ever do that, but yes, we, we've all run into that, Okay? But it's coming out of a place of, yeah, you, Cooper. Nobody ever does that for you. Okay, he is a cute little guy, though. Um, but nobody would, uh, we all do this. And this is what we want to be. We want to do these things out of love. And we want to share out of love. I was talking to Lorianne, my wife, about the um, sermon last week. And I normally don't say this, but if you weren't here last week, it might be worth 20 minutes just to go back and watch it on YouTube, because I think I hit a nerve in a good way. And, um, but we were talking about it afterwards, and she said, you know, a lot of good stuff in there, said a lot of good things that needed to be said, a lot of hard things that needed to be said. And she said, you were getting close to, but you didn't fall into the be better trap. And what she meant by that is something that we talk about as preachers. A lot of times you get a preacher up here and it'll give you this thing, if you need to do this, you need to be better, you need to do more. But we don't help you out and explain to you how you be more or how you do those things. And when we talk about this and sharing our faith or anything else that we're doing, it's got to come from the inside out. If you put that next slide up, the Ezekiel slide. I love this. This is out of the book of Ezekiel. And this is a 600 years or so, give or take, before Jesus. And the people of Israel have been so bad. They've been just awful, doing everything you can imagine that God says, look, the only way I can get your attention is letting somebody come in, invade you, and haul you off into captivity. And then we can have some talks. Okay? And in the middle of that exile, where the people of Israel have been so awful, God says to them, I will give you a new heart. And I have a new spirit put within you. And I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. Basically, he's saying to these people, you have been so hard-hearted that your heart has turned to stone. And I love the imagery of that because we've all been there at certain places in our life where everything just feels cold. 
where the light just feels like there's no color to it anymore. And everything's gone gray. And your fingertips are always cold. And that's what the people of Israel are at that point. And God is saying, I am going to do heart surgery on you. That stone that's there, I'm going to put a real heart in there. And I'm going to put my Holy Spirit within you so you can feel again, so you can love again. This is what transforms us. This is what we come out of. And it's through that love and that hope that we can do these things. It's not about us doing better. It's about your relationship with God changing so it flows out of that. And so if you're feeling in that state where your heart is just stone, that's where we pray. That's where we work with God and say, okay, God, what do I need? Put those people in my life to change me, to watch over me. Now let's get nuts and bolts practical, because I get a lot of questions about just state of Christianity in North America, and I want to talk about that for a little bit. And what I'm going to show you is coming out of this phenomenal book. It's called The Great Dechurching by uh, Davis and Graham, wrote most of it, and there's a guy by the name of Burge who does a lot of the research. And it's phenomenal, because what they do is they actually do the research, do the survey stuff, so it's not what they think, it's what people are actually showing. So if you want to put up that next slide, please. These are the co- sum of it. If you want to, I will just tell you this. If you like this sort of thing, read the book or at least read the Kindle sample. And 10% of you are going to love this book. The other 90% of you are going to fall asleep reading it. Um, and as long as you know what you are, just roll with it, okay? But I, I love it. It's good for me. Um, but... These are some of the common reasons that they say people stop attending church. My friend stopped coming. I moved to a new community. Suffering changed my view of God. Message not relevant to my life. Begin to doubt God's existence or goodness. Or I disagree with the politics of the church. And when they say politics, they're talking both people saying the church is too liberal, too conservative, and I have no idea which one was more prevalent. But those are common things. And they get into other things, but I just wanted to point that out. Now, I want to point out something really interesting with this. What their research shows is that when people drop out of church, their theology doesn't usually change. So if you survey people who used to go to church but don't anymore, their theology and yours is probably pretty similar. But what happens over time is they drift away from church, and then without the support and the love and the prayer, that's what turns people into non-believers, because it just disappears. So let me show you the flip side of it. Next slide, please. These are reasons people come back to church. New friends, God tells me to come back. I find a church I like. I feel the distance from God. I begin to miss church. There's a good pastor. Sorry, we can't do anything about that one here. So, But I really want to highlight these two, these last two. I find a church that takes doctrine and ethics seriously, or I find a church that cares about justice and compassion. There's a lot of stuff on this list that we can't control. We can't control if people begin to miss church. We can't control how people interact with their friends. But we can be the church that God has called us to be. We can be that church that takes doctrine and ethics and justice and compassion seriously. We can be that church that loves the people and loves God. So I'm so excited when we have people like Ken here and Serenity and we work with those ministries because it is a way to bless our community and share that love that we first had. Share that love that God had for us. And what we're called to do is be the church. We're called to be that embodiment. Let me show you one more thing here. Uh, Next slide, please. Davis and Graham in their book write this, and I just want to underscore it for you. They, referring to people who don't go to church, will likely need to see the gospel tangibly demonstrated before they have much interest in in seeing it proclaimed. We need to share that love. 
Yes, we need to talk about Jesus. Yes, we need to tell people where we go to worship. But first, we have to exemplify it. And to be that pharisaical person who talks about how great they are and everything else, it doesn't help. We need to be out there loving and working in the food pantries and giving blood and speaking that kindness to people. Not out of us trying to be gooder, being better, but out of us and our relationship being changed with God. So it reflects. And I want to encourage you to put yourself in a place where you can be blessed. Put yourself in a place to study your Bible, to enjoy that fellowship, so that that blesses you and changes your heart more and more, so that you can share it with others. Let's take a look at one more piece. If you want to go to that last slide for me. This is out of the book of Acts. It's the passage I just read a moment ago. And I love the book of Acts for a lot of reasons. But one of the real things that I love about it is it's a group of people trying to figure out how do they live as followers of Jesus in a diverse, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious society where there's a lot of hostility. And it's like, there's a lot to learn. And the stories are just fun. But what happens is the disciples have gotten in trouble because they healed somebody and everybody's talking about Jesus. And everybody's like, what do we do with this? And so the religious authorities bring him in and say, don't be doing that or we're going to have to do stuff. Just don't. And they're basically like, what are we supposed to do? This is God calling us to do. And I want to highlight this. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So there's three things in there. Prayed, Holy Spirit, speak. Okay. They started out with prayer. And that's key. I get this question a lot of the time. It's like I've got somebody in my life, a friend, a relative, a coworker, somebody I care about who doesn't know Jesus and I care about them and I'm worried about them. What do I do? And when we have that conversation, we'll kick around some stuff and talk about some different resources and some different things you can do. But the thing I always say is pray for them. Pray for them. Pray that God will work in your life. Pray that God will watch over them. Pray that God will put people in their path who share that love, who exemplify that love. And we want to be a people of prayer for that. We want to be praying for our community, the people around us, the people who need Jesus. And it was interesting, we do this church health survey every year. And we look at just how we're doing and different factors. And the way it gets scored is it's against average for American churches. And a couple years ago, when you look at how we are praying for people who don't need us, know Jesus, we were like way up here, okay? But then last year, we'd, it was like we'd taken our foot off the gas. So we're still way above average. We're still got a good number in there. But I was like, wait, wait, we, we dropped. We dropped in that. How, how, how do we drop in that? And the more I was thinking about it, it's like, yeah, we, we took our foot off the gas. We were focused on other things. We didn't emphasize that as much as we should have. And so it stepped back a little. Not a huge amount, but enough that I'm like, oh, we got to do something about that. Because that's one of those things, like, I want us to be up, like, all the way at the top. Like, I'm 6'1", and I want to get a ladder to go to the top on that one. And so we want to continue to pray for people who don't know Jesus and those people in our lives who don't know. And we want to make it a point of emphasis. And I was talking to somebody a while ago, and they said, well, we got that table full of candles in the back. It's like, yeah, we do. We should do something with that. And so what we're going to do is we just move that to a little more prominent spot, and we want to encourage you. We're not going to release people to go, but you can go anytime. And we're going to leave it in that spot for a while. And we want to encourage you as you come in or go out or go to communion just to stop and light a candle for somebody you know and care about who doesn't know Jesus.
And we want to pray that God would work on their hearts, that God would love them, that God would show his love for them in some way that breaks through whatever is going on. Because that is the biggest peace that we can do. Yes, we live out of who we are in our relationship with God, but fundamentally this is God calling them in their lives. And that we pray that God puts us in a place to share And I just want to point out this. Again, it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they're transformed, and they speak the work of God with boldness. And that is who we are called to be. So let us pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this chance that you've given us. Thank you so much, most of all, for loving us, for redeeming us when we had no hope. And we pray that you would watch over us, Help us to speak your words with boldness. But most of all, we pray that you would give us a heart for the people who don't know you, to love them as you love us. Amen.